Welcome, everyone. Um, we're excited to have you with us today uh, for another great leader to leader discussion. And we will be using the Q&A feature. So if you have a question as our guest Kim Marshall is speaking, feel free to put that into the question and answer box and I will moderate those questions as we go on. So um, we have everyone introducing themselves in the chat box, which is fantastic. Just make note that as you are um, typing into the um, chat box that you've indicated everyone, meaning all panelists and attendees so that everyone is seeing your responses, not just the panelists. So with us today, um, we have Kim Marshall, who um, many of you know, have been, you've been receiving the Marshall memo, memo as part of your MASSP membership. And Kim Marshall is a national speaker and he also does an excellent job of curating great information that I know many of you appreciate being able to share with your staff and being able to learn from yourself. So we're um, happy to have you and thanks for joining us today from Boston, Kim. It's fun to um, be able to use Zoom for such a great feature, so welcome. Thank you so much. <clears throat> and welcome to all of you frontline educators. Uh, I, I have a little bit of a sense of what you're going through because my <clears throat> our daughter is a seventh grade English teacher in Boston Public Schools and is wrangling two of her own children at home and her husband is an eighth grade teacher in Boston. So <clears throat> we have a little bit of a sense from her socially distanced, of course, of what it's like to do that. And then our son is a high school history teacher in, in Seattle. Uh, and it's just begun actually an interesting format called an intensive where he is with his students 100% of the day for 10 straight school days. So that's one of actually one of the interventions that people are trying, uh, thinking about for next year, but they're doing it now in his school. So uh, we're hearing from them and my wife is a lawyer with the Massachusetts Department of Education in her office every day, dealing with a torrent of legal issues and advising the commissioner. So I got a little empathy, but I'm at home trapped here uh, not able to travel at all, doing the Marshall Memo, trying to keep it relevant, uh, and doing some other projects. So let me share my screen here, and uh, let me get into a little bit of what I hope will uh, do two things. First of all, uh, humanize the Marshall Memo for you, since uh, you probably thought it was, it was actually done by an algorithm uh, or a group of consultants in Boston or something like that. Uh, and then I want to suggest some very specific ways that you may or may not be doing right now uh, to use the Marshall Memo in your schools. So, um, so let me launch into this and just give you a little bit of a history here. Someone did a cartoon a few years ago of what I'm basically doing. By the way, did you notice the hair is a little different than the photo that uh, Wendy showed up front? Uh, so one of the markers of the COVID-19 for me has been I have not had a haircut in three months. So, uh, so I'm looking a little different right now. So, uh, so this is the pile of stuff that I go through each week. And I want to talk about why I started this after I finished being a Boston principal for 15 years, why I started the Marshall Mental, how I produce it. Again, I want to humanize it a little bit for you. <clears throat> and then four layers uh, of use, especially now, especially as we come to the end of this very traumatic school year and as we think about what the heck is going to happen next year. So uh, I, I want to use poll everywhere. And so can everyone please grab your cell phone uh, and go to the text feature <clears throat> and then please put into the two box 37607, 37607, that's in the two box. So put that in the two box and then put Kim Marshall 346 in the message box. So 37607 in the two box or oval, Kim Marshall, two L's, not case sensitive, 346 in the message box, then hit send. And that will register you for a number of poll ever questions that I want to do. And it is pretty miraculous that coming from Boston to, to you, uh, more than a thousand miles away, we can actually do this. Uh, so I, here is actually the first uh, poll ever question. Uh, so if you can just quickly, uh, with your on your cell phone, put in A, B, C, or D, depending on how much, how frequently you're getting the Marshall Memo. So look at this. Coming in over, I'm going to close the window here because someone's mowing the lawn across the street. Uh, so just, uh, and of course, your organization is giving this to you, but it may be something that's caught in the spam filter, or it may be something that you trash because you just got way too much to do. So just keep keep putting in your in your things into your into your inbox excuse me, on your text feature. <clears throat> so let's get another five seconds here. And you can see that most people are getting it regularly, which is great. Some people only sometimes, and some people are only reading occasional articles. Okay. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I, 
if you want to be added, just email me <clears throat> and I will put you on the list. If you want to get it directly from me on Tuesday in the middle of the day, that's fine with me. We can, or you can wait for it getting. So can we just uh, do a little quick exercise here of, of what is your number one issue right now in your school or in your district? Well, what is the thing that's top of mind? And it can be positive or it can be something that's concerning. And if you can just think for a minute and boil that down to two words, one or two words, it can be one word, it can be two words, but just boil it down. And we're going to do a word splash in just a minute to just get a kind of a visual picture here. Just think through. It's probably popping right up into your head. One or two words. And here we go. So if you can just, again, type into your cell phone, <clears throat> what are the one or two words that are top of mind? Wow, graduation, access, <clears throat> shortfalls. Oh, wow, shortfalls. Wow, budget's a huge issue. Now, so far, they've only had, oh, now budget just got another response. It gets bigger when we have more. Graduation is huge right around now. Budget, equity, keep putting in your responses. We'll have another, like, 30 seconds for this. And just keep an eye on this as it emerges here. Graduation budget, the biggie so far, budget just got a little bigger. Relationships, transition, students, divide. Collaboration, relevance, short funds, schedules. Equity got a little bit bigger here. Cuts, 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 cuts. Everyone's worried about that. Uncertainty got a little bigger. Shortfalls, equity got bigger. Budget is, budget is still number one here. One big word, wow. Okay, another like 15 seconds here. Just get your, uh, what was the, what's the empty? Oh, empty building with quotes. Okay, that's two words. Wow, empty building. That is so depressing. Shortfalls, future. Okay, another five seconds. IEPs, year, health. A lot of singletons here, and then a few huge uh, big ones here. So that, that sort of gives the big picture. Uh, graduation, of course. We've got more coming in here. Wow. So if you have any, any comments or thoughts on this, this is a pretty good, and by the way, I'm gonna save these responses and I will send them to Wendy afterwards so you can, you can look at, at what, the, what the big picture was here. Wow, <clears throat> pretty magical. <laughs> People are still sending stuff in. Budget got bigger. Budget, graduation, and equity are sort of, the learning, learning among the top three here, wow. Pretty cool. Okay, so let's let's move on here. So what is the problem to which the Marshall Memo is the solution? Now, you may think this is a pretty obvious question here, but as I emerged from my principalship, I was pretty exhausted, 15 years, large elementary school, Boston Public Schools, uh, staggered out of, out of my school. And by the way, please take care of yourself. I, 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 it occurred to me that, first of all, there's way too much for people to read, and I had been doing a lousy job as a principal doing all this reading. And then a lot of the, the best articles are too long, like sometimes 40 pages long, you know, long cap on articles and so forth. And then you've got operational responsibilities, and now we're in the middle of this, of this incredible crisis here. But I really believe that our colleagues, whether it's teachers, <clears throat> uh, teacher leaders, consultants, um, instructional coaches, students, parents, they want us, in fact, they're depending on us to have the best ideas. So that's, that's a lot of pressure. And, and the issue is time. I, I heard this wonderful quote from Curtis Jones, an award-winning uh, superintendent down in Georgia, the hardest thing to get your arms around is time. So how are we gonna do this? So you've probably seen Stephen Covey's uh, quadrants on time management. So the, the top left-hand one, quadrant one, is important to student achievement and you gotta do it right now. It's urgent and it's important. Right below that, it's actually not important, but it's urgent. Phone rings, superintendent asks for something. Bottom right-hand quadrant four is not important and not urgent, and yet we still do a lot of those things. And quadrant two, is the sweet spot of school leadership, which is not urgent, uh, but really important to student achievement and to student school culture and all the rest of it. So that's actually where the Marshall Memo sits. And I am your designated reader. Now, you may know that this is a mom and pop enterprise. I do this pretty much alone. I'll tell you some other people chime in here. I subscribe to 60 publications and I branch out a lot to other places. So I make it my business to find the best ideas every week and get them to you in a brief summary that you can read in five or 10 minutes, okay? So I'm basically trying to bridge the gap between theory and practice, between all these people who are writing good ideas, find the best ones and get them to you. I do have subscribers now in all 50 states and 74 other countries. So it's spread completely by word of mouth, no advertising and so forth. So it's, for you, it's a burst of professional development. And I was very naive as a principal. I thought if I put things in people's mailboxes, they would read them, but they were usually too long. I told them the table of contents and something, they would read it. Now you read, I wish I'd had something like this as they went. So if you're curious about where the articles come from, big picture, 
I, at the end of 2019, end of last year, I, I did a count <clears throat> and it's automated in the system. And Ed Week does an amazing job. I don't know if you get Ed Week, but they are an amazing package. They do a terrific job of commentary, breaking news, which I don't do. 899 articles as of last New Year's Eve. Ed Leadership, the ASCD publication. I'm sure that's on your coffee table. Okay, a lot of articles. Fidel to Kappen. Now, notice that Kappen, although it's number three, has the most classics. The classics are the articles that I've, and I want to talk about that in a minute, that I've identified as the best of the best. The New York Times does a fantastic job of education reporting, principal leadership. You might be surprised at the Harvard Business Review. Like, what's up with that? But they always have good articles on the psychology of leadership and all well, culture and so forth. Then you see a few others there. So why do I put this out on Tuesday? <clears throat> So I've gotten into a rhythm over the last 16 and a half years of doing my reading on Sunday and my writing on Monday. And my wife comes home from her very busy job, <laughs> even more so now, and we proofread it together after dinner. And she finds no fewer than 50 typos and errors, including more than once pubic schools, okay? Walk instead of work, she catches all those. She's wonderful at that and also a great editor and has great political judgment and so forth. And then I start sending it late Monday night and then it goes out and <clears throat> takes about 15 hours to send. So, so here I am on, uh, on Sunday. <clears throat> this is about seven or eight hours to go through a pile that looks like this. <clears throat> and I look at every page because sometimes there are good graphics or photos or other things I wanna use. And I fold over the ones that look promising. Okay, so you can see there to my left on, on the orange pile there, those are the keepers, okay, very few. The middle is the recycle and the last pile is something, I don't know, and I got, I got over to my right there, I've got stuff I can write notes if I want to. So uh, I'm highly selective and that's basically what people want is they want my judgment after 51 years in this business, a teacher, central office, principal and consultant and reader. So I'm trying to find stuff that will actually improve teaching leadership and learning. I want stuff that's actionable. I don't want too much theory. I got to be convinced. I'm skeptical as I read each article, as I thumb through it, I want to be convinced. I look for new ideas and I'll talk about a few in a minute, but also promising classics, things that just haven't, you know, haven't been talked about for a while that we need to come back to. I also make a point of cautioning about ineffective practices, things that really don't seem to be too good, which we keep coming back to. For example, teaching to learning styles, okay? Things like that. I look for stories, I look for good quotes. I'm not doing breaking news, I'm not doing puff pieces, I'm not doing stuff that strikes me as being duh, you know, that's pretty obvious. So here's Monday, this is where I'm sitting right now. <clears throat> the big computer is to my, to my left here. And this is just always 11 hours. It always takes about an hour for each article, trying to do an intellectually responsible job of summarizing something that you can read in just a, just a few minutes. So basically the big picture of the Marshall Memo is what takes me 20 hours to do every weekend, you can read in 20 minutes, okay? So that's, that's the big picture. And then from Tuesday to Friday, I'm out on the road <clears throat> presenting, <clears throat> going coaching principles. This guy is Brian Blau. I'm coaching in, in the Bronx in New York City, but not now, I'm not going anywhere right now. So I wanna talk about the research because people say, you know, all the research says and people bow down to research. But the fact is, first of all, that a lot of the best research is, is ignored. For example, it's very clear <clears throat> from research from Minnesota actually and elsewhere that no high school or middle school should open before 7.30 in the morning, okay? But so why does my, oh, excuse me, before 8.30, 8.30 in the morning, my daughter's school opens at 7.15. My son's not much later. So we're ignoring that research. Retaining students, out of school suspensions, a lot of negative research about that. Grading on a 100 point scale. I, I actually should have a clicker question on that right now, a poll question to see how many of you are still doing that. Thumbs down from the research on grading on a 100 point scale. So, <clears throat> so those are things that we're ignoring. And then the research has blind spots, like how many minutes should an administrator be in a classroom to form a reasonably good impression? Uh, what's the best way to give teachers feedback? We don't have research on that. What's the most effective way uh, to, what, what should we be coaching principal, teachers on? So all those things are ignored by the research. So I'm skeptical about research, but I read it all the same. And I'm always looking for good promising innovations and so forth. So let me just give you a quick story, a quick example of something where there's no research but where it's something that I put in a memo, and you may remember this story. A, a teacher, a third grade teacher <clears throat> in, the, in the Northwest of the United States 
gets the idea of telling her kids about wealth distribution. Okay, she sees this museum exhibit and she says, I want to teach my kids as part of the math curriculum about wealth distribution. So <clears throat> she has the kids bring in dry mac macaroni. And these are her kids and they're sorting it out into groups of 10 and then groups of 100. And they're putting the macaroni 100 in each bag. And they wound up with <clears throat> 90 baggies. That's 9,000 pieces of macaroni. Then, and we don't have a picture of this, but then she divides her rug into five equal parts with masking tape. And the kids sit back and she says, how do you think the wealth in the United States is distributed? Wealth being toys, food, houses, cars, bicycles, um, swimming pools, limousines, mansions, whatever. How's the wealth distributed? And the kids take a shot at it. They go from the poorest, not too many baggies there, to the wealthiest, there's more baggies. And she says, okay, now I'm going to show you how it really is. So the kids sit back, they, they circle the rug, and she goes to the poorest quintile, and the poorest quintile proportionally, and she did the math on this quickly, the poor, poorest quintile is nine individual pieces of macaroni, just nine. She had to open up. The second one is 18 individual pieces of macaroni. The third is 150, so she had a bag and a half there. The fourth, I've forgotten the exact number, the fifth, the, last, the richest, was 72 bags of macaroni. Oh my gosh. The kids will never, ever forget that. Now that's a story I just had to put in the Marshall Memo. It's not research. And we could get into an interesting discussion about whether third grade is the best grade to do this. But still, it's a fascinating and wonderful story. So <clears throat> grab your uh, cell phone again, please. You don't have to re-register. It remembers you. Okay. So how have you used the Marshall Memo so far? So just key in more than one. You can put in as many as you want. The, the ways in which you've used the memo so far. By the way, if any of you uh, are not schooled in Poll Everywhere, uh, Poll Everywhere, which is what we're using here, is the best software platform for doing polls like this. It has a number of advantages, the biggest one being that it's easy to get things uh, into a PowerPoint presentation or Google Slides or Keynote. And so uh, if you want the directions to how to use it, I've actually done quite a lot of work on this and I have a checklist for a Mac and for a PC environment. So, um, so you just email me and I'll send you those directions. It's, it's good software. Okay, get your, get your response in here. Just another 10 seconds. So what we're seeing here is mostly from my own learning, but also sharing, 21 of you sharing with individuals, Oop, 22, uh, sharing with groups, forwarding the whole memo to the all staff, five of you. Looks like one person doing live uh, faculty meetings. I want to talk about that in a minute. Six of you going to the archive. Three of you sharing with parents. It's very striking, very few uh, sharing with parents because most of it is pedagogical. So uh, I want to talk about four levels of using the memo. And I think each of these is more urgent now <clears throat> with the pandemic than it was before, but it continues. The first one is just using it for yourself, okay? Your own professional development. Strategically sharing articles and quotes with colleagues. Exploring the archive, which only a few of you have done. And then the last one is this idea of using all faculty discussions. <clears throat> and I have, a, have a, just one thing at the end about that. So the first one is, is your own development. Okay, so here you are. You read the memo. It comes in on Tuesday, the middle of the day. Maybe you read it then. Maybe you, you're a binge reader. You save up a few. But, but you, you basically look at it and you skim through quickly which of the things that make something uh, me, are meaning, meaningful to me. And a lot of them you're not interested in. So you skip by them. Okay, and you think about other areas, maybe you read the original article. Okay, so I want to recommend, and Wendy has these, and I think she's going to share them with you. These are articles uh, that I think are particularly uh, pertinent to the, for leaders right now uh, during this crisis. And, and it's just that these are listed, it shows you where they came from. If you want to look in the memo archive, or actually Wendy's going to send you the, the, uh, the, the PDF of it. So I just want to look at the first one by <clears throat> Barry Jansen and Jerry Murphy. Amazing article from a few years ago. They said that one of the hardest things for leaders is to admit confusion. So can you admit confusion, be humble, and still lead? That's the, that's the question. I'm just going to give a very brief summary here of this, of my summary of a, of a much longer article. It's hard. We don't want to appear incompetent. We don't want to lose face. And we, don't, we might feel ashamed, okay? So nonetheless, <clears throat> say Jensen Murphy, we have to embrace our confusion. We have to assert our need to make sense, which is a great tactic at this point. We have to structure joint inquiry with our colleagues. What's going on here? We have to listen 
because our colleagues often have the best advice for us here. And then we have to openly process our need and our effort to make sense. Wonderful article, highly recommended, especially relevant now. Okay, so that's, that's level one. Level two is something that only some of you have done so far, which is use the memo as a force multiplier. As you read through the memo uh, each week, the, the headlines of it, you're thinking, and I wanna reassure you that it's okay. In fact, it's strongly encouraged for you to clip and share articles from the memo with strategic colleagues. I actually don't recommend sending the whole memo out to everybody because a lot of people just trash that and get annoyed. But if you send, for example, a list of recommended children's books to your librarian or to the pers person who publishes books for the English department, that's great. Something for the art teacher, something for the third grade team, the algebra team, all the science teachers. I mean, you, you know, the power of electronic series, you can just clip and share because you, you're getting a Word document. And then there's some things that are, that are relevant for the whole staff, but not many. Okay. Or maybe you form a study group. Maybe you're rethinking your discipline policy. Maybe you're thinking about differentiation. So you give them a particular article. And then occasionally, and actually especially now, sending something to families. Because the memo has really put together a, a bunch of stuff about understanding the pandemic and thinking through what's safe and what's, what's not safe and how school might look in the future. So I wanted to take an example of one memo. Uh, here's the headline page, okay? Memo 813 is from back in November. And I, I just wanted to have you think through like who would you give some of these articles to if, you, if you're not already doing it. Like the first one is a wonderful story about a project-based learning thing taken on by a first grade teacher whose children found a dead bird outside the school at recess. Bird had flown into a window and which happens a lot, billions of times a year. And the teacher, the kids were fascinated, and the teacher decided on the spur of the moment to do a two-week project-based learning unit on that. I was talking to a principal up in Maine, and he crossed his arms and he said, well, you know, that wouldn't be on the standards. Well, actually, there are standards that would absolutely go with that, with that uh, project. So who do you get that to? Well, if you're in elementary school, maybe the first grade team, maybe anyone who's interested in project-based learning, okay? Then there's uh, the third one, fixing gifted education's underrepresentation problem. Perhaps that's been an issue in your school. Maybe that's something for your leadership term. Uh, the fourth one down, <clears throat> the issue of racial stress for African-American kids. A psychology article really looking at the incredible stress that black kids are on, unbeknownst to, to many of us, okay? Uh, banning the N-word in schools, okay? <clears throat> so a boosting math achievement. S organized recess. Are you happy with the way recess if you have recess in your school? So these are all, and I want to just highlight the last one. Actually, I'll come back to that later. So these are all examples where I strongly encourage you, please <laughs> clip and share, and it makes you look smart as a school leader, and it really gets good discussions going around your school. Another thing is the quotes. <clears throat> So look at this first quote here. Every memo starts off with some quotes. This is a British teacher who said, instead of asking, does anyone have any questions to students? I now ask, ask me a question or ask me two questions. So with a quote like this, a wonderful practice that this teacher said made a huge difference in his classroom in England. Now, what would you do with that one? <clears throat> would you put it on a bulletin board? Would you uh, start off a staff meeting with it? Would you put it in your weekly bulletin? I mean, it's, and then maybe invite some, some teachers, like, what do you think of trying this? You know, try this instead of, because, you know, when a teacher asks the, anyone any questions, there's usually crickets. But when a teacher says, ask me a question, <clears throat> okay, or ask me two questions, it changes the dynamic in the classroom. So just an example of a, of a quote that might really be kind of cool uh, for your staff <clears throat> and get people thinking about stuff. So you may have noticed that usually in the last section of the memo, there are often videos, <clears throat> links to videos. And uh, maybe you've tried some of these. Most of them come from my son in Seattle, who's wonderful on the internet. Uh, for example, the first one, think of a, a fifth grade class trying, trying to figure out uh, the uh, issue of uh, the distortion on flat maps. So this video shows a man with a large beach ball of the world. He gets a box cutter and cuts it open and flattens it out on the ground, showing very clearly in about five minutes why it's so hard to do an accurate map on a flat surface as opposed to a three-dimensional surface. Um, the Atlantic slave trade, the last one there, a graphic that shows every single voyage across the Atlantic from Africa to North and South America and Central America over about a five-minute period. It's, it's, a, it's an incredibly powerful video just showing the scope of the slave trade, unbelievable. Uh, <clears throat> Carol Dweck on mindset. This is by far the best uh, best video on mindset. All of these you can go into the archive if you don't already know the login. I'm going to tell it to you in a few minutes. 
find these videos, play them for teams of teachers, play them for the whole faculty. Some of them are funny, some of them are incredibly moving. So, sorry, we got, got a guy across the street here on a very hot day here in Boston uh, doing his lawn. <laughs> So you may have noticed also that I've now aggregated all the art issues and resources so far for the memo for the beginning of the pandemic in one document, which is on the website. I give the link to the update. I actually just updated it this morning. So uh, there's an up more updated than this. And you can, within this document, you can click to quotes, you can click to articles on understanding the pandemic from the ki and kids' perspective, articles on the human side of on all the articles so far. Um, and you can share this document with anyone. It's, it's open source. The last one, by the way, is my own teaching materials, some of which are really, they're all free, and some of which are relevant now. So again, these are all things relevant to the crisis right now. So let's pause here. What are some memo items that you passed along that have really helped you and your colleagues? Uh, and have you experienced any pushback on it? Let's pause here and just go into the chat function. And Wendy, if you can just forward to me uh, or just speak to me <laughs> any questions or comments, or especially things that have especially been helpful to, to your colleagues. Guys, we will use the um, chat function for this. So go ahead and enter in your thoughts about um, things that have been extremely helpful um, and uh, items that, that you kind of just want Kim to know that you've looked at and really used. <clears throat> And then if you've had pushback, if there are things that have been, I, I don't get too many emails, but there are some that I've gotten that, you know, just on, on an issue, a hot issue, like, um, for example, evolution or something like that, where, where some people get, <clears throat> get their backs up. So we're seeing comments about articles about grading and better aligning grading and meaningful feedback. I've always got my eye open for articles about grading. It is such a fascinating debate, the 100-point scale, averaging grades, all that kind of thing, yeah. Um, someone asked, um, how could I have the memo emailed uh, again? And just for MASSP members that are um, participating today, the um, Marshall memo is in your um, Monday headlines document that you get from us. We try to kind of condense the amount of email that we send. So we don't want to send too many separate items. So we've embedded that right into our weekly communication. Um, and if you're looking to receive that separately, I think you just offered that in your intro, didn't you, Kim? Mm, yep. Yeah. So if people just email me, I will, uh, I will put you on the list and you'll receive it on, you know, the minute it comes out <laughs> on Mon late Monday night and Tuesday morning. So that might, it sounds like that might be six days ahead of when you're saying it. Is that correct, Wendy? Yes. On Monday. Uh, okay. So if you want to get it earlier and directly to you with the, your, your first name, comma, you know, address directly to you, I'm happy to do that. It's, it's just no, no, no extra charge for that. So we um, had someone comment that they really appreciate the um, social emotional learning articles. Uh -huh. um, and that, you know, obviously has been an, art, uh, an area of great focus more recently than ever. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's an area, again, as I go through on Sunday, go through that pile, I'm always looking for good articles that are perceptive and see the huge number of articles that have been in the archives so far. Uh, you know, you'll, you see them every, every week, but in the archive, there's been a huge number. I've had to create a number of sub subtopics on uh, social emotional learning. Kind of related, you know, with relationships, um, building rapport, uh, people are commenting about formative and interim assessment. And uh -huh. um, someone mentioned um, articles from Jennifer Gonzalez. And uh -huh. I, I personally really find her articles to be great as well. And she recently uh, wrote an article about the uh, return to school um, that I thought was one of the best articles I've read uh, on that topic myself. That is actually the lead article in this week's Marshall Memo. <laughs> well, and there you I go. We all landed on a good one then. I, th I think uh, Jennifer Gonzalez is amazing. I think she lives in Arkansas, I believe, with, she has three kids in school. I just had an email from her the other day. I'm often in touch with the authors uh, of the articles that I summarize. And, uh, and uh, the biggest compliment I can get from an author is that I did a good job of summarizing their article, that I did an intellectually responsible job and got the key points and the key quotes without making it too long. I've uh, recently started um, really following um, and, and um, shared the book and done some 
um, article shares with uh, Phyllis Fagel, um, a middle school counselor. And, um, you know, middle level um, articles are a little bit harder to come by. So I, I've, I've been really valuing her work as well. Mm -hmm. Someone else mentioned standards based grading as being a hot topic. Yeah. Uh, by the way, if you ever see an article that you think is good that I didn't do, please tell me. Now, my biggest fear in doing the Marshall Memo is that I miss important stuff. So please, anyone out there who sees a great article, it can be in a newspaper, a magazine, it can be a blog, it can be anything, please, uh, please send it along to me. It's, and I will make sure to take a look at it. Great. Well, that's everything we had in the chat about. Great. Okay. Well, it's, it's so cool that this can be interactive. Uh, thanks so much. Okay. So level three is using the website. <clears throat> and again, th this is the website, marshallmemo.com. Okay. And in the website, and we're going to look at it in just a sec, you can see the publications read so far, the topics, uh, the stuff I've written myself, reader feedback and headlines on all issues. This is in the outer area of the website without, without a, a password. And I just want to show you a couple of things here. This is uh, just the, the headlines thing. And the ones in red are the ones that I've highlighted as classics. <clears throat> so the classics, I always wait a week. And I go back and I look over the memo at, you know, a week away from writing, get a little distance on it. And which of the articles that really stand the test of time? Which are the real classics? And I highlight them in red and they're in a special place on the website. We'll look at it in just a minute where you can uh, download just the PDF of that particular article, not the whole issue. So these, these are the ones that I think are the best ones. Now, this is the physical archive. This is right downstairs from where I'm sitting right now in our basement. I have these cubbies built for it by a carpenter. And this is all the back issues over the last 16 years of all the magazines that I subscribed to. And my camera didn't have a wide enough lens to get all of them. There's, there's a lot of stuff down there. You do not want to have to go down and look at that archive. This is a, this is a nightmare, <laughs> kind of a pack ride. And sometimes I do want to go back and find an article, you know, that I lost track of. But, but the beauty of the internet is that, you know, I can upload into, into a virtual archive uh, and, and I use a database, FileMaker Pro. So the last thing I do every Monday night before I start the memo sending is to upload to the cloud uh, all the different fields for each article, the author, the publication, the date, uh, elementary, middle, or, or high school, or all levels, uh, and two topics for each article. So you can search <clears throat> by all of these different fields, okay? So let's just take an example here. Let's say, um, uh, one of the interesting uh, issues that I see in schools is teachers referring to uh, boys and girls as you guys. Now, you probably heard this a lot. You see it in a restaurant. Somebody, will, a waitress will come up to a table of three women and say, are you guys ready to order? Turns out there have been several articles written about this. Uh, but you don't remember the author and you don't remember the publication. So what you might do is put the word guys into the keyword box, into the, into the author box. Uh, not the author box, excuse me, the, 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 the publication box right, or the article title box and it might pop up. So that might be a way of finding an article that you actually don't remember too well. You, an author, for example, Jennifer Gonzalez, you could put that in and all the stuff by her will pop up. So it's very searchable and you can do an overlap search. For example, if you were an elementary principal and you wanted to find out about bullying at the elementary level, you could do both of those and it would, it would do a Venn diagram for you. So let's actually do a search and I wanna alert you to the fact if you don't, if you don't um, have this in your, in your list of, of login passwords, to get in, you just do marshallmoment.com, M-A-S-S-P in the email box, and M-A-S-S-P in the password box. So it's, it's real easy to get in. So let's just take a look here at the Marshall Memo Archive and do a, just a little quick sort of model of exploration here, uh, just so you can get a sense of how this works. Um, yeah, move this here. Um, let me go to the Memo website <clears throat> main page. So here's the main page. If you go to marshallmemo.com, this is what pops up. A little plug for the book here, the best in memo. So let's just look at, uh, let's look at, um, let's look at the um, topics covered. So here are all the topics <clears throat> so far. <clears throat> so there's quite a few topics. And look under assessment. Somebody mentioned assessment a minute ago. Look at all the subcategories under, under assessment. For example, somebody mentioned uh, interim or benchmark or periodic assessments. There are 128 articles so far, 124 about that topic right there. On the spot formative assessment, where is that? There it is, 186 articles about that. Uh, Standards-based grading, okay, there it is. 
Okay, so all student anxiety about assessments. This just gives you an idea of the extraordinary number of things that are in the memo archive, and we'll actually log in now. So you remember what it is, right? M-A-S-S-P, doesn't have to be in capitals. M-A-S-S-P, we can't see this, but it's there. So now we're logging in, it's asking me if I wanna save that as a password. So now we're in the inner area where only members like you are. And let's, we can go to back issues. All the back issues are there. You can search for any one of the back issues in PDF or Word, but let's search the archive. And let's try that thing about guys. So you're looking for that article about you guys, because you've been kind of troubled about that, <clears throat> you're, about teachers referring to boys and girls as you guys. So you want to find the, that if, if there's any article. So let's try putting it into the article headline box. And let's see if anything comes up. So I typed it there under article headline. I'm now hitting search for articles. Let's see what kind, if anything comes up. Son of a gun. There's two articles so far, and one of them is a classic. Look at that, from Memo 750, that's a couple of, of, of years ago. So we could click on either of these and see the whole article, okay? Pretty cool. Let's try a different one. Let's try searching for Jennifer Gonzalez. So let's put in, let's just try putting in the Gonzalez. Because usually the last name, uh, if, unless it's like Smith, you know, is going, to, is going to come up. So let's see what we got here. It looks like there are 49 articles with Gonzalez. Uh, <clears throat> look at this. Yeah, you know, it looks like almost all of them are Jennifer Gonzalez. So again, just by clicking on one of these things, you can also click on an HTML. You will get the memo and then you'll be able to quickly find the article uh, that you're looking for. Uh, let's see, let's try one other kind of search uh, function here. Let's, uh, let's look at the topics list. We're going to search archive again here. And so here we, uh, you see the headline, you can do uh, which publication it comes from. You can do the title, you can do the author, you can do the grade level, elementary, middle, high, or all. But let's, um, oh, you know something? Here's a hot topic right now is looping. So looping, the idea of teachers keeping their kids uh, for two years, you know, for, for next year, like coming out of this crazy year into next year. So looping, look at all these topics here. Looping is, is, a, is an idea that is very much being discussed now. And maybe probably many of you have thought about it. My daughter's thinking about it in her seventh grade class, keeping those, there, there is looping, you see it? So there have been now 12 articles so far in the memo over, the, over all the years of the memo about looping. So let's click search for articles, and here they are. And one of them was from just actually th three weeks ago, is this looping's moment. Okay, there's another one, the effective year-to-year -year classroom continuity on student attendance. Okay? Next one, the benefits of students staying in the same teacher for two years. So here all, so if you were forming a committee or if you were thinking about next year, uh, you know, you might very well want to search for a particular thing in the archive. So get one other thing here. Uh, so leadership is a big category in the memo and you're all leaders. So let's look at the leadership cat category here. Where is it? There's literacy. Okay, here's leadership. So look at the, at the articles under leadership. And you might, at this point, you might click like uh, crisis management, okay? And let's see what comes up there. Schools reopening webinar. Uh, that's actually something that's happening this afternoon. <laughs> uh, there's Jennifer Gonzalez looking over the horizon. There's ideas for reopening. So here are some specific articles on, on crisis management. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, gonna log out of here and go back to the slides here. So, um, so just, I hope this has raised your consciousness if you didn't already have it <clears throat> about the extraordinary amount <clears throat> of stuff that's available. When you have time, or if you wanted to get teachers to search for something, <clears throat> okay, perhaps you could have a committee, tell them the password, it's okay, and look at those. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention, but, but at the top of the topics list is classics. If you check that box <clears throat> and hit search, it brings up all the classics. Or you can do a, a Venn diagram search, classics within interim assessments, for example. And then <clears throat> just below that is all faculty discussion articles, which I'll talk about in a minute. You can click that box and you, it'll bring those up. So here are some interesting topics um, that are a little hard to find, and I just want to highlight them very quickly for you. Uh, <clears throat> some high schools, perhaps one of yours, have done the exercise of putting a, a, a card with each student's name on it, perhaps um, <clears throat> the graduating seniors or perhaps the, the sophomores. Okay, so every student has a blank card with their name on it. And the faculty mills around uh, writing everything they know about this kid, their hobbies, where they want to go to college, um, you know, family issues, um, you know, whatever. And 
every time a school does this, uh, there are always a few kids that nobody knows anything about, that they're the isolated, quiet, <clears throat> perhaps troubled kids. And it's a galvanizing experience for a high school. I, I'd, I'd be interested, I, I should have a poll question on this, of how many of you have done this. So that, uh, th there have been several articles written on this by principals and by researchers. It's a powerful practice. So to find that, you would look under high school identifying isolated students. Cafeteria, the radical idea of a unitary lunch in a high school, one hour block in the middle of the day with no classes, split in half between teachers on break and teachers offering yoga, basketball shooting, free shooting, <clears throat> uh, math tutoring, et cetera. Every teacher offers something in one of the two halves. The kids eat anywhere in the school and uh, the, the miraculous impact that this practice has had on the morale and the test scores of many large high schools, particularly in Northern New Jersey. So articles about that, teacher supervision, the idea of shadowing a student through a school day. Literacy, how do you reduce the grading burden? Both, both of my children are humanities teachers. Their grading piles, electronic, of course, are huge. How do you cut down the grading load? There's articles about that, et cetera. Okay, so just, just an idea on some of those. So what will you search for in the memo archive? <clears throat> I hope I've provoked you here. I hope I haven't exhausted you. <laughs> so uh, just uh, again, in the chat box, uh, think about a topic that you're interested in that you might do a search on or, or have someone in your staff do a search on, <clears throat> delegate it to somebody else. My neighbor has finally finished mowing and uh, weed whacking and blowing his lawn. So thank goodness I was able to open the window. So Wendy, are we getting any, <clears throat> any ideas here on searches? Sorry, I was muted. Um, oh. Yes, we are seeing things like evidence-based reporting, uh, leadership, um, that uh, unitary lunch, um, that, was a, that was a new concept for some people um, that thought that was going to be pretty in, an interesting thing to read about. Um, leadership, improving morale. Once again, standards-based grading is a, top, is a, a popular thought. Um, Notice, by the way, that the standards-based grading is under assessment. It's one of the assessment subtopics. You can see that as I, as I built this list over the last 16 and a half years, I've had to create new categories, and I've tried as much as possible to have groupings like leadership, assessment, teacher supervision, et cetera. So you, can, you, have, to, you have to sort of fish around to find which topic things are in. So um, an idea is that during a staff meeting, you might be able to have teachers search it for best practices. Oh, yeah, yeah. The teaching section is outrageous. So uh, there's, uh, there's teachers, like things like moonlighting, things like that, and then there's teaching, actual pedagogical processes, and there's a ton of subtopics under that. So again, teachers could just, uh, I mean, really intellectually curious people, when they get into the memo archive, <laughs> they, they have a ball because it's just, there's so much stuff there. I mean, there's more than 8,000 articles in there. It's a little mind boggling. And you have to think about narrowing the search down by perhaps only going for the classics within, remember that you click the classics box and then you click the topic that has a lot in it and then it narrows the search down. Uh, I think some things people, of course, you know, hot topics under our current conditions, you know, looking for things like distance learning, um, looking for things for social, emotional, um, you know, in a remote setting, Mm -hmm. um, all of those types of things I think are, are going to continue to be like really key. Um, student growth models for teacher evaluation, team teaching. Mm -hmm. I think uh, <clears throat> look under, uh, for, the, for the online learning, uh, look under teaching online. It's one of the subtopics under teaching. <clears throat> That's where the distance learning stuff is. And there's lots of it. That's Pretty much all the chat has stopped up on that topic. Okay, well, again, I urge you to do this. You remember the login is super simple, M-A-S-S-S-P, M-A-S-S-P, you know, and just log in and, and give it to anyone that you think could, could use it. Okay, so the last level <clears throat> is the idea of an all-faculty discussion article. 
And this is something I never did as a principal. <clears throat> Again, I wish I could time travel back and, and do this, but there's certain articles <clears throat> that lend themselves to being read by the whole staff. And I'm talking about K to 12. And I've, I've chosen 54 articles from the thousands and, the, and I put them in one place. You can click on them in one place. You saw them at the top of the, uh, of the topics list there. And the idea is that you've got a faculty in a room or online virtually. Uh, they all have a hard copy or an electronic copy of the article. They read it in real time. And remember, all of my summaries are only they only a page and a half usually. So it takes five minutes, five or 10 minutes to read. People underline, highlight, think about it individually, just silently. And then turn and talk, and you know how to create breakout groups in, in Zoom or in whatever uh, teleconferencing software you're using. And so people chat about it, and they do a protocol. They go around <clears throat> talking about what they agree with, what they disagree with. Everyone has a chance to talk. And then you come together as a whole faculty and discuss what are the implications of this for our, our school. I'll give an example. Uh, Jennifer Gonzalez had an amazing article about worksheets. Now, worksheets is a, is a, is a, a sore topic with, with many teachers uh, because they depend on them. I certainly did as a sixth grade teacher, but uh, they can be crappy. And Jennifer Gonzalez's word for that is busy sheets, or they can be really high quality. They can be like an original source document, uh, an amazing graphic uh, design from someplace. So she says there's a continuum from busy sheets to power sheets. And the staff reads this article silently, it's about a page and a half, <clears throat> turn and talk. And then the, the, the action implication of this is with your week sheets, where are they on this continuum? You know, and while well, some of them, I got to admit, they're kind of busy sheets. So, but here's one, here's an example. The staff thinks this through and maybe even does a school-wide um, inventory of the quality of worksheets the kids are getting. It's a really powerful, just professional practice that I think a whole, a whole staff, whether it's elementary, middle, or high school, especially high school, should think about. So that's just one example of that. Um, and again, in the archive, you just click, you, go, you log in, and then you, at the top of the topics list, this just at, next to the top is all faculty. You click that, hit search, and it brings up all of these and they're organized by topic. So there's some on discipline, there's some on memory, on memory functions, <clears throat> there's some on staff culture. <clears throat> and I really recommend, uh, maybe you have, have your leadership team or maybe a group of teachers, skim through these and think, is there anything here that would be particularly uh, pertinent right now. So here's a question for discussion right now on the chat. Could it work in a, in a virtual faculty meeting? <clears throat> and what are some particular topics that you think your whole staff should be thinking about at this point? Just do a chat and, and uh, Wendy will relay your, your questions or thoughts or ideas to me. You know, since the pandemic has started um, and we've been doing these leader to leader sessions, we've been using that breakout feature um, and having people go back, you know, go out and come back and then report what was discussed. And it's really a pretty simple feature to be able to use. And once again, you know, kind of a great way for principals to model something that teachers could use with their students as well. So if you're really trying to get that level of engagement, it, it does work pretty well. Yeah. I wish I'd had a poll question on this. I think I'm going to write myself a note here that this, this, is, this is a good place for a poll question. So any ideas coming through in the chat of... Um, yep. yep. Uh, so we're seeing um, reaching all students in a remote setting. Um, people are talking about differentiating in online formats. Uh-huh. Um, really everything related to the remote learning, you know, motivating students in remote learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, the, the way the place to search for that in the archive is under teaching uh, online. <clears throat> That's the subtopic of, uh, the, uh, for this particular one. Um, right, how, well, to make, how to make distance learning more effective, robust, and interactive, um, supporting mm -hmm. parents. Uh huh, yeah. One thing I actually want to look at here um, <clears throat> is. We're fairly close to the end here, but I want to go back to the memo archive and and look at um, Okay, so here we are at the website. <clears throat> here we are. Oh, we're still in. We're still logged in. So here we are in the, in, in the inner area, the members home area. So let's do search archive here and just look <clears throat> at the all faculty box here. See it. So I'm checking that box. And I'm just going to hit search. <clears throat> uh, these are not by level. 
Okay, so let's look at some of the things here. Protocol for discussing articles. Oh, <laughs> Jennifer Gonzalez and improving grading. Okay, Tom Gusky on overcoming obstacles. And again, when you click on this, you, you control click on this, it will bring up the entire article as a freestanding PDF. So there it is. You see, just not the whole memo, but just that particular article. And you, as you can see, like most memo articles, it's only a page and a half long. So it can be read in, in five minutes. Uh, so that's, that's that feature. But I want to uh, highlight one other thing here. Let's go to the home page and let's look at Kim's published writing here. And let's look at this first one here, which is ideas and resources for the school closure crisis. Now, this was updated this morning. So this includes everything up until this week's memo. And you can see what, what here, I showed you an earlier version of this. So for example, uh, pedagogical issues with online learning, which is what was just mentioned here. This zips down here, okay, to this section here, veteran online teacher shares what he's learned. This is someone who's been doing this for years. Uh, why one middle school uh, student prefers online instruction. This is a shocking article in the New York Times by an eighth grader, Veronique Mintz, in, in a middle school, a New York City public school. And she says she actually prefers online learning because her teachers can't control their classes. So this is a pretty, uh, a pretty damning thing. Imagine how embarrassed that principal is because he or she knows who they are. And this kid says, this is why she prefers online because the kids in her class are rolling around on the floor uh, and the teachers are struggling. They're pushing, kidding, hitting each other and so forth. So that's a depressing article. <laughs> Classroom management when students are in their PJs. So again, this is a, a collection of all, it's 45 pages long now, all the articles so far. Let's go back to the, to the main page here, to the first page, and their quotes. And so this, uh, this might be, again, a resource for specific suggestions for online learning, articles on planning for school reopening. And here's Jennifer Gonzalez's article, Wendy, that you just mentioned here. Specific ideas about how schools around the country, she did a, a, a Twitter um, thing. She went on, on Twitter, she got hundreds and hundreds of reactions and this is her synthesis and then this is my synthesis of her synthesis of the, of the best thoughts so far for coming back together. Here's another one by Mike Petrelli, specific ideas. So again, I commend uh, this to you. Remember, remember this is on the main page of the website uh, under Kim's published writing. Uh, it's, the, it's the coronavirus summary I update it every week. Okay, so where were we? Uh, almost finished here, just a few more minutes. Um, so, oh, we're not gonna do that one here. So what are your takeaways, okay? <clears throat> Could you see using an article like this for the whole staff, for the whole staff and so forth? And then we have one more Paul Everwood question for you here. How do you plan to use the memo? Now that you've heard me nattering on for 50 minutes, uh, what are the areas, again, with your cell phone that you want to use the memo? Uh, this, is, this is the same categories we had at the beginning, but perhaps, uh, perhaps there's a change now. We've got at least one for all faculty discussion. Oh, I actually added in videos at the end there. So showing videos in meetings. And you can click as many of these as, as you think uh, aspirationally you're gonna go for. Well, certainly a lot of people excited about their own professional learning. <clears throat> All faculty discussions archive, mostly for your own learning, which is great. I mean, that is the main audience. Remember, I really put the Marshall Memo together for something that I wanted for myself when I was a principal. Nobody was showing videos yet. Well, the video that I wanted to highlight earlier is, is a, a really amusing thing where they had two 17-year-old boys and they showed them, um, a, they gave them a rotary phone. And they said, okay, will you dial a number on this? And they had it hooked up electronically so that when they dialed the number correctly, it would go through. And these boys who were, you know, perfectly intelligent young men could not figure out how to dial this rotary phone. So it's a classic example of what's called the curse of knowledge, where we understand something. We, you know, we know how to dial a rotary phone because we used to do it, unless you're much younger than me. Uh, but, but it's hard to explain it to somebody who doesn't understand it. So I, I would actually use that video 
in a staff meeting. It's, it's really funny. It's about maybe 10 minutes long as these kids struggle to figure out how to, how to you know, dial, how you work a, dial, a rotary phone and then have a discussion, maybe turn and talk and then a discussion about, so what are the implications of this when you're trying to explain something to kids that, it's, that you understand, but that they really don't understand. Okay. So <clears throat> this is pretty encouraging. Uh, we have a spread, some, some shift from the first one, and I am gonna save these, and I will send the slides to, to Wendy with the, the polling data saved. So everyone got their responses in, great. Okay, so any uh, questions? We just got a couple of minutes here. Any questions or, or comments or ideas or suggestions to me, things that I should be particularly looking for, just do it in the chat. We have a few minutes and Wendy can, can relay, relay them to me. Well, I'll tell you, I thought that uh, I knew pretty much everything there was to know about our Marshall memo, but um, I had not been using the website or searching uh, in that manner. So that's, that's definitely something I could see myself using in the future. And uh, I think the videos too, you know, a lot of times um, those of us that do a lot of professional development or even a staff meeting, you know, to bring in kind of that video feature, um, even if it's just a half hour, an hour meeting, it definitely, you know, helps with engagement and um, making connections. So I think, I think those are great things that you shared today. Mm, good. There have been a couple of really wonderful uh, musical videos made by kids that I've shared in the memo. If you go back a couple, and then they're also in, the, in that uh, compendium. Uh, one young woman who plays six different instruments and she sings a song all by herself with all the, again, using the Zoom features to show her playing these different instruments. And then an amazing thing by the EL Learning Kids, uh, a song that they composed. And, and again, using the Zoom capability to show many different kids. It's really very, very moving. I mean, something I think all teachers should look at. And, and that was in the memo and it's also in the compendium. So just so you're aware, um, when I tried to go into Poll Everywhere for your last question, um, it said that um, my time was up for that poll. And so some other people said that as well. So if you weren't seeing as many posts, um, there was difficulty with that. So our, our data is not uh, stellar uh, in that pre and post. Well, that is interesting. I'm gonna get in touch with the poll <laughs> everywhere about, about uh, why people were shut out because it should, I mean, I wonder if there's a time limit on that. That's a, that's a good question. Yeah. yeah, so just so you're aware, I just, uh, because okay. I, I know you were just saying that you wanted to look at the, the comparison pre and post, so it, right. it was a little impeded. Well, that, that is important feedback. I wonder if people's um, cell phones time out or whether poll everywhere kinds, that's excellent feedback for me. Any other, okay, we're just a couple of minutes away from, from witching hour here. Any other comments or questions or, or thoughts uh, before, we, before we close out? No, everybody was um, just really positive um, saying that this was really fantastic and helpful. Um, so we will, um, as we have done with all of our um, leader to leader sessions, we post these, uh, we record these and post these on our website. So people will have access to them. And then um, Ryan, who is uh, joining me as a panelist uh, today, um, is our director of digital learning on MASSP. And, and Ryan can kind of take this information and he creates what we call Tech Bytes, uh, where he puts these into kind of a 10 minute or less format overview of, of a particular uh, app or feature. So this might be something that he can focus on as well because um, you know, obviously, if we're sharing this resource with people, we want them to maximize the use of it and uh, going on the website and finding articles that are, are pertinent and also sharing them with staff and kind of in the different examples you gave, I think are all really, really great examples and ideas. Good. Great. Well, this is a pleasure. I hope it's helpful. And, uh, well, and um, hey, by the way, uh, no, no, I said that's that's and, and let me know if you have any other questions or comments and anyone who wants to get the memo directly. Uh, just email me and I'll put you on the M MASSP thing and you'll get it uh, Tuesday in the middle of the day. Thank you so much, Kim. We really appreciate it. And for Thanks. those of you that are still on and wondering what we're going to be talking about next week, I just wanted to let you know that we are going to have a panel of superintendents from around the state uh, join us next week. So we're really excited about that. Um, we'll hear from Chris Weigent, the executive director at, the, at MASA, the Superintendents Association. We will have Gerald Hill from West Bloomfield, Jamie Hitchcock from Oak Park, Brian Davis from Holland, uh, Janice Swift from Ann Arbor, Lou Steigerwald from Norway Vulcan, John Van Wagner from Alpena, and Glenn Maleko from Dearborn. So as you can see, we kind of made an effort to make sure that we had good representation of superintendents around the state 
and we're really looking forward to getting their perspectives on how remote learning is going and what they see moving forward. So thanks everyone for joining us uh, today with Kim Marshall. We will post these slides as usual, uh, post a recording, and also some of the resources that Kim shared with us as well. So thanks everyone and have a great rest of your day.